having class tomorrow due to the continued winter storm warning. Actually, when I'm recording this, I'm hearing a plow go behind me. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear that on the microphones. Um, but we're not having class tomorrow, so I wanted to finish up our conversation about Geertz because that provides the basis for the rest of the readings that you have and our conversation that will take place on Monday. So I want to make sure we get through that reading um, because really when you spend time working through each of the concepts, it takes more than 50 minutes, so I'm not surprised. Um, but since we're not having class tomorrow, I don't want to fall further behind. Now, on Monday, what we're going to be discussing is the reading that you have on cricket fighting, which I want you to read through the lens of Geertz, and that's what the in-class writing, which is due tomorrow, is based on. If you need an extra day, that's fine, but I don't want you to fall behind. You'll also be reading uh, the chapter, which is on Blackboard, which is from Colin Gerald Mack's book called The Global Pigeon. In this chapter, he focuses on South Africa's million-dollar pigeon race. You don't need to memorize every detail. I want you to read this through the lens of Geertz, the way he approaches sport, as we're as I'm talking about in this lecture, or as he approaches the study of culture. And then what you're also going to be reading is a short piece that I wrote, uh, the Society Pages, a website requested I write this piece based on how the UFC returned or basically chose not to stop at the start of COVID while other sports were shutting down. When you read that, what I want you to do is think about how I used Geertz, right? This is a shorter piece. I'm trying to make it more accessible. See if it makes sense how I'm using Geertz. And then also think about this is a good transition into thinking about sports and COVID, which is going to be the topic of your first debate, uh, which I do need to, I'm going to put together an outline of things you have to consider. Okay, so let's get into Geertz. Last time, uh, last two times, we introduced Clifford Geertz and, and the study, just thinking a little bit about who he was. We talked about the methods that he used. So he conducted this ethnographic study, meaning he immersed himself in the culture to try to get a more naturalistic understanding of how people engage with this practice. He wasn't conducting interviews. He wasn't doing surveys. He was observing. He was taking part. He was talking to people. He was living in the village. Uh, we thought a little bit about how he defined deep play, this concept that he takes from Jeremy Bentham, a utilitarian philosopher. And then we worked through some of the key points, right? We thought about how it builds alliances and, and uh, reinforces relationships, difference between deep and shallow matches and bets, connection to masculinity. And then we looked at how he drew on Goffman's idea of a focused gathering. Now, for those of you who have read Irving Goffman, Goffman also uses the term for his approach, the dramaturgical approach. Geertz also describes his approach as dramaturgical. That's not a coincidence. Geertz had read Goffman. There's a lot of overlap. What Geertz does is somewhat different. We don't need to get caught up in that. We don't read Goffman. However, if you are reading Goffman for a different course, say sociology of violence, uh, maybe in social theory, it's worth thinking about, but you don't need to know it for this course. All right, so let's think a little bit about what he says cockfighting actually does for the people of Bali, for the Balinese, and then we could think about the larger lesson. Geertz, uh, I'm trying to think how to say this, Geertz basically explained the meaning and significance of the cockfight in Bali by showing how the betting around the fights reproduced and reinforced the social kinship structure of local tribes and communities. People in Bali would bet for particular animals, or rather their trainers, to demonstrate their communal ties and commitments to kin. It wasn't just that utilitarian approach of trying to make money. Last class, I talked to Justin a little bit, who did the one-minute reflection at the end of the class, and he was talking about a friend who uh, bets on football games. I think it was football games. He does a ton of research, has all these spreadsheets, and he bets on the games with the goal of making money and basically moving up his class position. This isn't what Geertz is talking about. That's not deep play. That actually makes a ton of utilitarian sense, right? What, what Justin's friend is doing is turning it into labor, turning it into a job. That's not what's happening in Bali, right? It's about doing something deeper, doing something that doesn't on the surface make rational sense. Now, also what's key is on the surface, nothing, spe nothing specific or concrete changes in the winning and losing. However, at some deeper level, and this is key to Geertz, and it, so according to Geertz, at some deeper level, something important did happen. Social networks were put on display and they were actively enacted. In this performance, in the cockfight, community and kinship ties were confirmed and reestablished. And I've repeated that a few times because it's so important. That's, that's the key part of it, right? That's what he thinks it's doing for the people. And you're also performing all these different struggles, right? Village versus village, man versus man. It was very rare to see a, a woman raising a rooster, although now you might see that. Um, city versus city, nation versus nation, nation, man versus nature, right? And you'll see that even more with pigeon racing. Um, you could see uh, potentially man versus his own limits. Um, you'd see that more in other sports, not as much cockfighting, but you still could make that argument. Or even good versus bad, if you say, well, this is the good side, this is the bad side, right? 
Um, now the question is, what's the role of the anthropologist in all this? Because he's making an argument about how culture works, which means how do we study this as anthropologists or in our cases as sociologists? Well, popular cultural forms and practices, such as those associated with sport, what we care about in this class, could be read as a text or a book, right? That a social analyst might read over the shoulder of their subjects. We peer over the people actually performing this culture and we say, well, what story is being told? And Geertz's point was that if a social analyst and a cultural critic can properly read, that is, they can analyze and contextualize that text that they see, we have a really powerful window onto the ideas and meanings that constitute the life worlds and worldviews of the human subjects in these specific contexts and communities. So Geertz's argument about the importance and impact of cultural practices, really, it endows these cultural forms with almost this autonomous role and function in social life. This text exists, exists separate from everything else. It's an illegal activity, right? It's a separate type of practice, and yet it has this powerful storytelling. The dramaturgical pr approach suggests that the social and historical dynamics of sport, they don't just reflect the larger, more general forces of history and society. It actually provides a platform and pathway to ensure their reproduction. And I'm going to come back to that point in a little bit. So that's, that's not the last you'll hear me say words or words like that. Now, the key takeaway, and you're, you're going to hear me repeat this over and over through the course of the semester. You're probably going to use this or you should use this in the debate, the upcoming debate. Um, so we'll talk about this a lot. But the key way to think about what sport does beyond just saying Geertz is about the dramaturgical model, what we mean is that what sport does is it serves as a platform through which social relationships could be recognized and interpreted by the social agents who are living them out. Right, we talked about that over and over. You perform the kinship ties. You get to see that. You get to observe them. But what's key is, is and this is to quote him, it's both a model of and a model for social solidarities and alliances. It's this model of and model for that's really key. Now think about that for a second. If you have a model of something, it basically means it's a reflection of something that already exists. Right. You have a Lego model of the Taj Mahal, or you have a Lego model of the Death Star. I guess that's not a good example because it doesn't actually really exist, but you see what I'm saying. It's a model that imitates something in life. A model for something is basically you have a blueprint that you follow in making something, right? So one reflects and one actually guides. So he's saying that sport or these these cultural practices that we engage, that these deep, these deep these acts of deep play. It's a model of and a model for, not just one, but both. So if we think about which of those three approaches to sport he's doing, he's doing all three, right? It's a reflection of society. It's clearly that. It's about life world and subculture because it's about the experiential, the way of living this thing out. So he cares about how groups come together, that, that uh, Geertzian term we used last time, right? The focused gathering. In a sense, as you're looking at the gathering, it's about how you experience these things. Um, although he doesn't as focus as much on the subcultural aspect of it, but I mean, that's, that's part of it, right? But then there's also the third. It's about, it's changing society too. It's not just reflecting society. It's not just you're living it out. It's actually changing. It's that model for as well. So again, this is the story the Balinese tell about themselves. This is the model of and the model for society provided by the Balinese. This is why sports make such good documentaries and movies. It's so easy to make a sports documentary. I mean, it takes time. It takes money. You have to get footage, all those things. There's bad documentaries. There's bad sports movies. But it's really easy to tell a story that resonates with society, right? That part's easy. And when we think about sports, when we think about those classic stories, right, they resonate with society because they're telling the story of society. They're reflecting the story of society. And they're providing a model. We want to be more like them. We want to work hard. We want to strive. We want to overcome odds. We want to do all those things. We, we see the good and evil. We want to overcome the villains or the bad guys. We want to be hurt and persevere. Like all those types of things, all those things that we celebrate in our athletes, that's the story being told about society. It's reflecting society, but it's providing a model for society. And you can do that with any sport. And I won't take a ton of time doing this, but you can do it at different levels, right? You can pay attention to the arrangement that happens at a focus gathering. Right. So I'll skip ahead a few slides and you could think about um, what's actually happening at that event. 
How are people interacting with each other? Who are they supporting? Right? What does it mean to support the Buffalo Bills? You don't bet against the Bills if you're if you're from Buffalo, even if you know they're going to lose to New England, which no longer is true, right? But you had about 20 years running when Tom Brady was on the Patriots where so that was occurring. It was about reinforcing kinship ties. It was about telling a story about about the city itself. Um, but you could just think about the sport. I mean, the sport in general, right? Football, most popular sport in the United States. Think about all the different ways that we can analyze football. It's often thought of as one of the most patriotic sports in the United States. It's thinking of, uh, you could think of the different ways it's connected to the military, all the different events where you see military being presented. Thinking about the different, I mean, again, Geertz would try to think about the larger narratives and stories, right? That'd be one of the ways he could approach it. You can even think about the metaphors being used in football. There was a famous, uh, I think it was a famous joke by George Carlin. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, if there's any George Carlin fans, but I'm pretty sure George Carlin was the one who made this observation about all the different military metaphors that's being used in football. Time to go to war. Uh, once preseason's over, um, I think people say time to use live ammo. Uh, like a tank. Um, it's kill or be killed. It's like a war out there. Thinking about the passing game, blitzing, a bomb, airstrikes, running as a ground attack. It's a field of combat. The, the, the offensive defensive line meet in the trenches. You talk about what player you want to be with, in the, especially quarterback in the foxhole. Um, it's actually interesting. There was a study done, I think it was by an historian, and they found that during times of peace, the, milita the militaristic comparisons um, were actually drawn more clearly between war and football. When there's actually war, those that language drops, which is kind of interesting. Um, you can think about how the game is played. And again, sports sociologists, sociologists study sport, don't really care about the rules of the sport, except when it says something larger about society. Geertz would pay attention to these type of things, right? This is, this is telling us something. There's a different story being told in basketball and football. In football, there's very clear positions. There's a very clear delineation or division of labor. And each person has a very specific task. And often, they can't do the tasks that the other people can do. The quarterback can't do what the line does. They're not even allowed to in some cases. The line can't catch it. The, the person, the offensive line can't catch a pass unless they check in and they get permission to do so. Versus something like basketball, look at LeBron James. LeBron James can do literally everything, right? You can't say there's something he can't do. He passes, he dribbles, he shoots, he plays defense, right? He can play every position. He can play point guard, he can play center. Tom Brady, arguably the greatest football player of all time, really would only be a decent football player at one position, right? It's not like you could switch and he would be good. Um, it's a different story about a different arrangement. Um, you could also think, Geertz was doing this with the cockfight, who's allowed to participate and who doesn't and how, how do they participate? Where are the women in football? Well, most of the time, they're relegated to the sideline, right? And they're presenting themselves in a very particular way for the audience, and they have a very particular role. You could think of the fans. Even the advertising to the fans has a very particular model in football. And then you might say, well, where are the women who play football? Well, there's two professional leagues. One is the Independent Women's Football League, which I'm guessing none of you have ever heard of. And the other is the Lingerie Football League, right? So there are professional football players who are women, but again, there's something being told about, there's a story being told about society here. When we're thinking about a model of and a model for, there's a reflection, there's an indication, right, of something about gender roles in society. All right. Um, you could even think, and I'll try, to, I'll try to wrap this up because it's going longer than I actually said I would go. You could even think about something like sports journalism. Geertz would be interested in the connections of fans and how people interact around sport, who tells the stories about sport, Right. How do these shows work? How many of you have watched Around the Horn or Pardon the Interruption? It's angry talking heads. There's this, there's, this is the model. And, we, and what's interesting here is you can see how political coverage, political journalism has taken on this model more than the opposite way. Right now, when you watch CNN or Fox News, you see the exact same setup sometimes and the exact same type of rhetoric and discourse. Other thing you might pay attention to is the big business around sports. Look at what would be an obvious example. Look at the names. Look at the names of stadiums, right? Where, what type of what type of words do you see adorned across these massive billion, million and billion dollar stadiums that hold sport that you get these zoomed in shots before the game is played? Lucas Oil Stadium, right? I think that's where the Colts play. 
uh, what's the Bills Stadium's new name? Um, they just got a new name, and I, I can't even remember what it was. But the uh, the Bills Stadium would be an example of this. Lakers, uh, where the Lakers played, it used to be Staples Center. Now it's um, uh, it's not is it not Bitcoin? It's uh, crypto. It's it's Crypto Center. It's uh, Crypto dot com. Right? Talk about telling us something about society shifting from Staples, which it became the name that was treasured, even though it represented a place where you go get paper and office supplies. And people were sad when that name left just because they were attached to it. And now you have crypto and people think some people celebrate it and some people mock it, right? Um, even the idea that we're not allowed to bet on sport and yet people do. Gears would be fascinated by that, right? Um, anyone interested in professional wrestling? What is professional wrestling other than very overt storytelling about society, about good versus evil, about uh, when there's political conflict? You could look at characters like the Iron Sheik who competed against Hulk Hogan, the American hero. Uh, you could look at when uh, uh, Hillary Clinton was running against Donald Trump. So not the most recent presidential election, but the, but the one before there was an Appalachian wrestler who uh, be, really became celebrated as a great villain. And his name was the progressive liberal. And he would say things like, you all need to drive uh, electric cars. You're all polluting. You all need to uh, stop coal mining, right? He took on the role of the progressive figure, especially someone supporting Hillary Clinton, and made that his character. <laughs> I mean, there's all these examples. Again, thinking about the role of women in society. Who are the, the professional wrestlers who are women? What are they called? Divas. They're literally called the WWE Divas. Right. Again, telling a story about society. Uh, why did I have this picture? Oh, uh, you could look at the history of wrestling in Mexico. There's a great reading on this event if you're interested on the uh, luchadors, right? And the mask wearing, what it represent, represents and the politics of that. All right. So that's what I wanted to say about Geertz. I'm going to end there. Next time we're going to pick up, we're going to get right into talking about cricket fighting. We're going to get into talking about uh, pigeon racing. We're going to talk a little bit about sport and COVID. And we're also going to think about how this analysis, how this Geertzian approach might help us when it comes to someone like um, uh, uh, Jokovic, right? An example that we talked, Novak Jokovic, a person that we talked about before. All right, I'm going to end there. My voice is run actually running out, so it's good timing.